Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. I'm super excited to get into your questions this Sunday evening. Before we do, I want to encourage everyone to go to rebelcapitalistlive.com and get your tickets to Rebel Capitalist Live ASAP. Some speakers. Got Mike Maloney, Peter Schiff, Robert Barnes, Kenny McElroy, Chris McIntosh, Jason Hartman, Lynn Alden, Simon Black, MC Robert Helms from the Real Estate Guys, Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, Bob Murphy, and this guy. Obviously, I don't know why they're letting him in, but for some reason they are. You can tell how low the standards are at Rebel Capitalist Live. <laughs> but 12 days away, guy, got, guys, got to get your tickets. Got some VIP guests, my good buddy Kiyosaki. Uneducated economist Tracy Shukart, Steve Van Meter. I'm sure there'll be more VIP guests that you want to rub elbows with, have a beer, ask a question, network with your fellow rebel capitalists. It's going to be an amazing event, guys. So get your tickets at rebelcapitalistlive.com ASAP. All right, let's get into your questions and see what we got. Oh, by the way, guys, I've got a huge announcement that I'm going to make at the end of of this live stream. So if you're watching, make sure you stay tuned to the end because you are not going to want to miss this huge announcement. All right. What do we got this evening? Hey, George, love the knowledge. My question is how many more boom bust cycles until we end up hyperinflating? Mm, I don't think we're ever going to hyperinflate, my friend. It's just... I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, there's really no reserve currency that's ever hyperinflated. You can say all the other currencies, world reserve currencies were backed by gold or something like that. But I just, I mean, obviously the probability isn't zero. But it's with the world reserve currency. It's, it's not that the U.S. won't lose their reserve currency. That's inevitable. That will happen. Now, it's not going to happen in days, weeks, months, or years, but it'll happen over decades. And that process has definitely started. That's for sure. But as far as hyperinflation, like a Venezuela type deal or Zimbabwe or Weimar Germany, it's just the probability is insanely low. Now, I'll give you some numbers, though, that you can look out for to know if we're getting closer to that, though. Uh, if you look at the M2 money supply growth for Weimar Germany going back to 1914, which is when they really started to increase their M2, it's about 66 zero percent per year, per year. And they didn't get hyperinflation until 1921 or 1922. So think about that. That is six, call it eight years of 60% plus money supply growth annually, annually. So think about what that is compounded before they got to hyperinflation. And you may say to yourself, oh, George will add significant inflation, blah, 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 before that. Well, yeah, they did. But I'd like to also remind you that the year prior to them experiencing hyperinflation, their currency actually went up in value relative to gold. Most people don't know that. So think about that. Imagine that, you know, the United States does that and you come out and say, oh, the end is near for the U.S. dollar. It's hyperinflation. Everyone's saying, no, what are you talking about? It, the, the dollar's gaining value against gold or something like that. Now, if you say that now, I think you're going to be wrong because we haven't had 60 plus percent money supply growth <laughs> over the last eight years. I mean, think about how epic it was that the money supply grew by 25% in 2020, 2021. But in order to even get close to Weimar Germany, we'd have to go the next eight years and have triple that, triple. And keep in mind, at the time, the uh, the their currency, I believe it was the, the Deutschmark, that was not the world reserve currency. So we would have to do even more than that to even get close. So my point is not that the dollar 
is going to maintain its value relative to goods and services in the United States. In other words, we're not going to have consumer price inflation. That's not my point. My point is not that the dollar will never lose reserve currency status. It will. It will. But as far as it actually hyperinflating, that probability is as close to zero as possible. But it's not zero. So if, if, if you're someone that thinks that's going to happen, what you need to look for is the United States having more than 60% M2 money supply growth over many, many years. And because the dollar is the reserve currency, you're talking like 200% money supply growth every single year for eight years before you can even start talking about hyperinflation. Now, that, that's if you're using the technical definition. Now, some people would say that 20% per year is hyperinflation. And that's a completely different set of probabilities. I'm just talking about textbook hyperinflation, which I believe is defined by like 50% per month. But how many boom bust cycles can they have? I, I don't know that there's a limit to that. I mean, look at Argentina. So uh, I, I don't know that there's really a, a limit. FRC is now bust. Was the problem rates being so high or how fast? Ah, uh, boy. I mean, you've got a perfect storm here. I think it's easiest if you break it down to the liability side of their balance sheet and the asset side of their balance sheet. On the asset side, I mean, they had probably a lot. I, I mean, I didn't study them like I studied Stupid Valley Bank, but I'm assuming they're in the same category. Stupid Valley Bank had a lot of fixed rate assets on their balance sheet, like treasuries, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, but they had very hot money on the liability side. And they had all tech companies that were burning cash. So how how they didn't come to the conclusion that that, that uh, people would take their deposits out, either because they're losing money or because there's just better opportunities in money market funds or, or T-bills, I, I just don't know how they could be that oblivious. They didn't manage their interest rate risk. I don't know how they could have done that. Also, they had a lot of commercial real estate as far as loans as assets. That's probably not too good. Who knows if some of those things blew up. But it's just kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy when you have First Republic, they get that cash infusion of deposits for those other big banks at $30 billion. But, you know, the, the, that just prolonged the inevitable, right? Like you got to put yourself in the position of a depositor at First Republic. Are you going to keep your money there? I mean, come on. And nobody is. So I don't care if the Fed bails them out or you're going to take your money out, especially if you got a lot of money. And uh, they probably had a lot of it of uh, depositors that were over the FDIC limit. And... You know, they've got to sell all of those assets on their balance sheet because all those people are taking the deposits out. They got to sell those assets at a loss. It just eats away at their equity or their their capital. And then, you know, they're they're insolvent very, very quickly. So I think maybe another question to ask is why did they not just go to repo? Right. Let's say that they had a bunch of treasuries on their balance sheet and you say, George, well, if they went to repo, they'd be able to borrow, but they'd be able to borrow at like 70 cents on the dollar because they had to take a haircut on it. Well, fine, but they don't have 100 percent of their deposits leaving the bank. You see, so let's just say 100 percent of the assets out of the balance sheet were treasuries that were yielding 2 percent. And the assets side of their balance sheet, let's just say they had, um, you know, 100 billion, something like that. And let's just say 50 billion wants to leave. So they've got to sell the, uh, you know, let's say half their assets and they got to sell those at a 70% haircut. Well, 
Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely bust because, you know, the math can work there. I'm not giving you exact numbers, obviously, but you see what I'm saying. Uh, if they're not, they could have like 25% of the people want to leave. And even though they have to take a 70% haircut on the asset side of the balance sheet, they can still manage that, right? Especially assuming that it doesn't happen all at once. So they, so that's, uh, I think, an interesting question is why didn't they choose that option? And I think the answer is because nobody wanted that counterparty risk. You know, they talk about liquidity. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but they talk about liquidity, 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 the Fed provides liquidity, but it, only to a certain degree. I mean, the banks have to provide that liquidity at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, do they have, are they balance sheet constrained? No, but they're constrained by counterparty risk. So I think there's no one wanted to touch them with a 10 foot pole. So, you know, what was their problem? Pick them, <laughs> right? I mean, they had the, they had a problem of the asset side of their balance sheet and they had a problem with the liability side and they had an overarching problem that the global monetary system is broken and that there's increased counterparty risk within the system. So nobody wants to extend that credit to the stupid Valley banks or to the first Republic banks because of the counterparty risk, not necessarily because there's all this balance sheet capacity constraints. How many on the planet earth do we truly know that central banks are piling record amounts of gold? Why should we trust these people? George, how do we truly know if they are? Well, I don't think there's any way of knowing definitively. Not sure that that matters though. I mean, if you're a gold investor, uh, to me, it really wouldn't matter if the central banks are buying or not. It's just, I buy gold for an insurance policy. Now, if you're maybe a trader, that might matter. But uh, to me, it doesn't. If you're just going through a, a, a thought experiment, then um, yeah, you can't trust them. They'd live constantly. So I would just try to watch their actions a little bit more than their words. And uh, then I'd also try to pay attention to who is buying and who's selling. And you'll see that the West is mostly selling uh, and the East is mostly buying. So I think that there's some important information that you can extract from that fact as well. But no, to your point, you can't trust them at all. Do you believe one day we will have a one world currency? Well, one world currency. Oh, okay, so again, no certainties, only probabilities. Probability is not zero. Probability is low. Now, will we have a one word, a one world reserve asset? I think that probability is much higher. So if the central planners had it their way, the global reserve asset for central banks would be digital SDRs, which is the currency of the IMF, central uh, uh, special drawing right. But that doesn't mean that it's a one world currency. It's just a one world reserve asset. Those two things are different. I don't know that the central planners and authoritarians want a one world currency. Because everything that I've read as far as their plan, I mean, I just did a video the other day where the BIS is doing this CBDC project with Norway and a couple other central banks. They're calling it Project Icebreaker. And they're literally testing this, rolling it out. This is not like fake news or tinfoil hat stuff. And when you listen to their, their, their game plan, they're very specific and explicit when they say they believe that this icebreaker will be the hub, which I think will be the BIS or the IMF, something like that. And they'll issue kind of like a, a settlement currency, which I think would be an SDR. But then each central bank will have its own CBDC. I, I've never heard them, the, the World Economic Forum or the IMF or the UN or the EU 
or any of these crazies, Davos types, I've never heard them talk about a one world currency, just a one world reserve asset. Those two things are, are much different. So again, I think the probability is above zero, but I think the probability is very low. Money market funds are holding short dated bills. How would a temporary US default affect them? Well, I, I'm not, I wouldn't really be worried about them. I'd worry, <laughs> I'd be worried about the global monetary system. You got to remember that the, the short-term T-bills prop up the entire system. That's the foundation. So you're basically playing this game of Jenga, right? And you're, you're pulling out one of those bottom pieces, or maybe you're pulling out two or three of those bottom pieces. That's what happens when you default on T-bills. And that Jenga puzzle, obviously, is the global monetary system. So w will one piece tip over the whole thing? Eh, probably not. W would two or three? <laughs> you, you really want to roll the dice on that? Because if the global monetary system collapses, then that's Mad Max time. And I'm not being hyperbolic. As Jim Rickard says, that's when we're living in caves, eating canned goods. So I guess to answer your question specifically, how would it affect them? I'm not sure because I'm not sure. You know, there'd be some regulatory issues. I'm not sure how their balance sheet would be set up. You know, is there a systemic risk? I don't know how it would affect them specifically. And then also a temporary U.S. default. So are we talking about a default of one day? Because that would be like one Jenga piece. Probably they may let them slide. But but again, I don't know. It, it could be one of those things that just a default, it just sends a shockwave through the entire system and you just see kind of like a domino effect where the whole house of cards plummets. But one day, you know, probably a lower probability, but if it goes on like a month or two, I mean, again, that that's caves and canned good time. Proper Mad Max. And I just don't think the, I don't think they'd allow that to happen. But how would it affect money market funds? I guess my answer is I don't know. That's just me being honest. But I get the feeling there would be some systemic issues there, especially if the default lasted longer than just a day or two. And, and there could be some systemic risk as well. I mean, people taking their money out of the money market fund, that could be a, a, a big issue as well. You see, that's the systemic, that's one systemic issue is people taking their money out of the money market fund because they're worried about a default, knowing that that money market fund holds those T-bills. And that money market fund is what was providing liquidity and repo. And then that, you see that chain reaction and then repo blows up because there's no more liquidity in repo because the money market funds were providing a lot of that liquidity. You know, that could be... Uh, we, we, the, the bottom line is you just don't want that to happen. <laughs> that's that's just the no bueno zone. We we need to avoid that at all costs. Did I see the prank called Jerome Powell? No, I kind of read about it, but I didn't really see too much of it. How much power does the free market have versus authoritarian governments and drone-like people that follow them? Can't authoritarians effectively destroy any free market and force coercion? Uh, well, it depends on the people. You're right. If they're all drones just sleepwalking through life, uh, just kind of blue-pilled, if you will, sure, yeah, the authoritarians can control them. But we know from history that people have the power to fight back and win, actually very easily, if they so choose, if they get pushed far enough. I mean, the truckers were a great example of that. 
You know, it was interesting. I was talking to my mom the other day and we were discussing this topic. And as most of you know, I'm here in Medellin and it's like a bird lover's paradise down here. You've got these huge like red scarlet macaws. You've got every single type of parrot you can imagine. You've got every type of bird you could imagine. It's just crazy. And I've got this, I'm fortunate to have a, a penthouse in this building. So I'm on the top floor, overlook uh, Medellin and whatnot. But I've got a couple terraces and I have a gal, a, a maid that comes over and does the cooking and cleaning Monday through Friday. And I actually have her put out uh, like some seeds and nuts and, and mango and papaya for the birds right on my, my terrace, right? So there's this family of, of green parrots, and I don't know what they're called. They're, they're, they're not the huge, like, macaws. They're just kind of maybe, no, they're maybe like eight inches tall, something like that. But there's a, but they've come to figure out that every single morning there's going to be some fresh seeds and nuts and fruit for them. So they're always up there. And, you know, even if I don't put out uh, the, the food, they're chirp, 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 right? But their bills are very powerful. And now every single morning, this family of parrots shows up to my, my terrace. And I can sit there, you know, five feet from them. They're just chomping. And, but, the, but they're mean suckers. I mean, they'll, they'll bite at each other and do all these things. So anyway, if I open the screen door, you know, then I'm like four feet away from them. Then they all take off. Right. And I got to thinking about that the other day. I said, you know, it's a lot like society. We are those parrots that if we wanted to, you know, in this family, by the way, there's like 15 of them. So think about that 15 parrots right there on my terrace that with these very strong beaks and super sharp claws. I'm like, if they wanted to, when I step out on that terrace, they could maul me. Now, they, they, they couldn't kill me or anything, but they would definitely, you know, if they teamed up to bite me and everything, they would definitely attack me to a point where I'd run back in the house as fast as I possibly could. They could definitely defeat me. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. But yet every single time I open that screen door, they're gone. They take off. And you see, we and the authoritarians and the central planners are just like those parrots that if we want to, when Klaus Schwab opens up the screen, if we come together, we can take him out. I mean, that's not a problem, but the fact or, or the problem, I guess, is not that we can't take him out, but it's, do we have the willingness to come together as a group to fight as a unit? Because we, just like those parrots, we definitely have the capacity. We have the capability to do that. All we have to do is choose to. And that's one of the reasons why I do the Rebel Capitalist channel. It's one of the reasons why I do these live streams is to get the message out to open up people's eyes. The average Joe and Jane, your friend and family member, Fred, to get them to realize what's going on so we don't have to wait until it's already too late. I mean, look at history. I always use the example of Romania and the fall of the Soviet Union, where those people stood up to the dictator who had been in charge, let's say, 20 years, ruling with an iron fist. Did they have guns? No. He had the guns. He had the military. He had all the power. He had the money. But they had numbers, just like the parrots. And you guys know the story. He came out, did his old speech. They started booing him. And he shot some people, and nine days later, they took him out back and shot him. They overwhelmed the military. They overwhelmed every all of his special police and whatnot. So, but but it took them decades of living under this tyranny because people are, are they're, they're just complacent sometimes. You know, they don't want to deal with it. They want to worry about their kids' soccer game or whatever. You you can push them very very far. Before, you, before they cross that line. So I guess my point is what I'm trying to do and what I'd suggest you guys do if you're someone that values freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism is just kind of do your part to open up people's eyes so that line that needs to be crossed in order for all of the average, the normies to come together to take out Klaus or to take out XYZ authoritarian or central planner 
and I'm not saying kill them, you know, obviously. I'm just saying push back enough to where they go and run inside just like I would if the parrots <laughs> uh, you know, came together and attacked me. We just want Klaus and the central planners just to go run away and hide and not come back out and understand that we have the power and we're taking it back and we don't like this authoritarian or author, author, authoritarianism and we want decentralization we want free markets we want liberty we want freedom so uh again what we're trying to do here is get that line closer to today than you know us having to wait and go through this tyranny go through the great reset agenda go through all these things before finally people are pissed off enough to stand together and push back and then use their capabilities so, you know, that's the challenge. That's what we're up against. And I think that, that the good news is, at the end of the day, we always have to remember that there's far more of us than there is of them. And that's what matters most. Is every dollar on the asset side of the balance sheet of the Fed guaranteed by the government taxpayer? Is every dollar guaranteed by the taxpayer. That's, hmm, that's a good question. Is it guaranteed by the taxpayer? I mean, I guess you could argue the dollar bills are, because they're Federal Reserve notes that technically are backed up by well, they were backed up by gold, so it was an IOU for gold, but now it's an IOU nothing, like Doug Casey says. But is that an IOU of, of future revenue from society at large, that green piece of paper, that Federal Reserve note? I don't know that it is. I mean, my base, my, I think the way I look at it is it's just an IOU nothing, just like a bank reserve. It's just an IOU nothing. And people just accept that this IOU nothing has some sort of value and they, they trade it for goods and services. High speed. <laughs> Are you going to visit SoCal? No, 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 no. No, I, I don't look, this is a good friend of mine. You got to come down here. I, it, trust me, you're going to have a lot more fun. If you come down here, than I go to SoCal and I'm doing all this physical therapy on my shoulder, trying to avoid surgery. I'm doing it every single day. I'm traveling as little as possible. I've got to go to rebel capital Live, obviously, but then I'm coming right back. Uh, I actually got to do Patrick Bet David and a couple other podcasts. And then we've got the collective, our mastermind group that's meeting as well. But I'm coming right back after that to stick to, to get back to my regimen of physical therapy. I'm doing physical therapy five times a week. So, and trust me, Medellin is a lot more fun than SoCal. Has Adrian afforded the gals content? <laughs> uh, no, I'm just. She hasn't told me anything about it, so I don't know if she has it. Oh, wait, she, you're saying she's already replied to my email, but I'm afraid that's all about the guy. Yeah, if she's replied to your email, then she's got it. She just hasn't forwarded it to me yet. I mean, again, I, I appreciate your concern, but it, it goes back to time. And, um, I, I, you know, more of my time is being taken up by this big announcement I'm going to make at the end of this video as well. When we look behind the curtain of Oz, we will see Klaus Schwab talking behind by big Mike Obama. So I think that's more of a more of a statement. Let's see. Question. When we look behind the curtain of Oz, will we see Klaus Schwab talk taking it? Oh, uh, <laughs> all right. That's kind of a joke. 
since silver is an industrial metal, do you see it lagging gold if gold takes off? Yeah, that's probably, especially for the next six months, if that's your time horizon, because, you know, then I think that's a buying opportunity. But because going into a recession, silver will, will probably perform pretty poorly. But I think my base case is that gold goes down as well. But maybe not to the extent silver does. Over the next three or four months. Well, well, I should say, while the Fed is cutting rates, once they start pivoting, I think the gold and silver go down because they're most likely going to pivot because there's a hard landing. Um, but again, that's the buying opportunity. George Canada passed Bill C-11, where the government can regulate what people see on YouTube. Oh, jeez. What are your thoughts on these types of laws? Just leave Canada. I mean, that, those are my thoughts. Get the hell out of Dodge, man. I mean, any argument that you would have for staying in Canada, the people that lived in Germany in the 1930s had the exact same argument. Same thing with Weimar Germany. Same thing with Venezuela. And in fact, that's a great example because most of you know that a lot of my employees are Venezuelan. And Adriana, by the way, is Venezuelan. And she fled Venezuela to come here to Colombia to Medellin. And she fled because of the hyperinflation and Chavez and Maduro and all that stuff that's happened recently. So she has firsthand experience in this stuff. And um, you know, we were talking about it the other day. That's when, when Hugo Chavez was elected... And even when he was the, the president there and doing all these crazy things that were going to lead to hyperinflation, people in Venezuela were calling that. They're saying, hey, this dude's a bad dude. We don't want him in charge. He's an authoritarian. This is going to end badly. And people were saying, oh, no, you're fear mongering. Oh, no, it's a, you know, the same stuff they're saying about Trudeau. There's, oh, no, it's never going to happen. People always say it's never going to happen until it already happens. And then in hindsight, they say, oh, well, it was obvious. So I know most people don't have the uh, freedom or flexibility or resources, I guess, to just go ahead and leave their home country or Canada. But if you can, I would, because it's going to get worse before it gets better. I mean, I just posted on Twitter a, th a, a great thread from a, a guy that lives in Canada with Trudeau talking about all of these things that he was doing to the uh, unmedicated, let's say. And uh, it's just kind of a quote from like a timeline quote of the things he said. And now we look back at that. They sound absolutely ridiculous. And he's completely wrong. And you could see where he is going with it. And I just simply put, never forget. Because we can't allow these politicians to do what they did in 2020 and 2021 and then just sweep that under the rug and let them pretend that never happened and just try to change the topic of discussion so we all forget. No, 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 no. No, we're going to have to hold their feet to the fire forever. That is unforgivable. And every single authoritarian that showed their true colors during the Cerveza sickness with the lockdowns, with the mandates, with demonizing people that didn't want to inject a foreign substance into their five-year-old. You know, those people need to go. They need to go. And we need to stand up and fight until they're gone. You know, I'm not condoning violence. Obviously, I'm using that term figuratively. But we just can't sit back and say, oh, well, yeah, that was 2020. Life's better now. Trudeau, uh, yeah, he's kind of an idiot, but who cares? No, 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 no. Get that schmuck out of office. Get him gone ASAP. If you don't, you got no one to blame but yourself. Have you ever looked into residency in Kuala Lumpur? Costs seem... No, I haven't looked into that. I'm just, I just like Medellin so much. It's, it's, uh, I, I have no desire 
really to go over there. But you know who does and has done a lot of work on that is my buddy Andrew Henderson. So I'd strongly check out, uh, I strongly suggest checking out his channel. And uh, you can see kind of some in-depth research that he's done on Kuala Lumpur. And I'm sure that, that that would answer all of your questions. What does Josh think about getting paid in pesos? He doesn't get paid in pesos. He gets paid in dollars. He spends in pesos. He loves it. <laughs> There's no bigger fan of Medellin than Josh. I can tell you that right now. Just, you know, if you have him on uh, Twitter or whatever, just DM, ask him what he thinks of Medellin. Okay, can I... When do you think the housing market will bottom? I don't know, but I can tell you what to look for. What you do is just pull up a chart of housing prices going back to 1900 adjusted for inflation. Look at the historic trend line. And when the housing prices hit that trend line, again, adjusted for inflation, very important. That's when you know we're close to a bottom. Could the CBDC lizard, lizard lizard ledger be confused with AI? No, but they'll probably use AI, part of the algorithm, to give you your social score. But they're two completely separate things. All right, guys, just bear with me looking for another question. Okay, boy, we've got tons of comments here. Appreciate that, guys. Just looking for a question. <laughs> All right, but my goodness gracious, I don't think I've ever seen this many comments without a question. Here we go. When would be a good time to purchase property in Mexico? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, when would a good time be to purchase I mean, what? The, the best time to buy a piece of property is when it's cheap. So I don't, I don't know if there's a specific time that I can say it's going to be cheap. You just got to look at your RV ratios, which is your rent to value. So, you know, based on your cost, including rehab and, and, and um, closing costs and whatnot, you know, how much rent are you getting per month? And uh, so is that 1%? Is that more? Is that less? If it's under, then... I don't really like it. I try to shoot for at least 1%. And uh, that's kind of how I'd make the decision as to the timing of when to buy. Do you think the U.S. dollar will become a secondary currency? Yeah, probably. I mean, it does turn out like the British pound. Whatever you want to call that, that's probably the, the destiny of the dollar over the next 25 years. Will it happen in the next two years? No, no, no. Probability, almost zero. So I don't know what currency is going to take over, but it'll happen slowly. I Actually, I can tell you what currency will take over. Whatever currency is being used by the country whose economy starts to grow and become the biggest economy in the world. So most likely China. You know, if if China continues on the same trajectory to where their economy 
is bigger than the U.S. and it keeps growing and growing and growing, then most likely they become the reserve currency because more people are going to want to do business with them. And that's usually how these things kind of evolve. But the problem there is that that doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen by decree. I, I mean, show me the reserve currency where the central planners came in and say, okay, today, boom, we're making it law that the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. That didn't happen doesn't happen. It's a bottoms up thing. And you can say, well, 1944, right. The dollar started to become the world reserve currency in the 1920s. It didn't, the, the central planners didn't have to force people to do it. They wanted to do it again. Why? Because the U S economy was becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger portion of global GDP. And at the point where you have Bretton Woods, then their economy is by far the biggest and then they had all the gold. So by then, it's just kind of making it uh, formalizing what had already started in the 1920s. And it'll most likely happen the exact same way with the dollar. That's why I say, you know, has the dollar started to lose reserve status? Absolutely, 100%. But does that mean that's going to, that we're going to choose or the, the BRIC countries are just going to force us all to use the new digital basket of yuan and rubles? Um, that's not how it works. It's got to be a, a bottoms up type of thing. And again, that takes decades. It doesn't happen in days, weeks, months. What are my thoughts on commercial real estate? It's just a, a bubble that's in the process of popping. How bad will it get? I don't know. But I think we're in inning two right now. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I don't know what the end game is. I don't know how they're going to use these buildings. I don't know if they're going to demo them. Uh, but demand's most likely not going to go back to where it was before. And then how does that impact? You know, I think the more or the bigger question is what are the systemic risks involved with all that debt that's on the balance sheet of the regional banks and the and the the banking system in general, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well. You know, this is just not a U.S. issue. You, you've got to remember, it's like a global issue. So with commercial real estate, you know, how many of those loans are on the balance sheet? And what if those loans can't be rolled over? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of risk here. There's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So that's why I say that we're most likely just in inning two. What countries are not corrupt? None. Next question. All right, guys, just bear with me. Looking for another question. Oh, here we go. Why not experiment by feeding? Why not experiment by not feeding them for it? Nah, they won't attack me. They were talking about the birds. I think that's kind of, they're joking. Okay, guys, just again, looking for a question. All right, well, let me go to the bottom here. Let's see if I can have more luck there. Okay, why, no, that's, we already answered that one. What do you think will happen if RFC Bank uh, just does Pat, what will happen with RFC Bank? Does I think you're talking about First Republic, maybe? 
Does Powell understand he is in a way of destroying investment banks, a backbone of America, RFC Bank? Hmm. Does Powell understand he is in the way destroying investment banks? Um, I don't know if he's really destroying them. I mean, we've raised interest rates several times before without without destroying the investment banks, and they should have seen it coming. Uh, I don't have a lot of sympathy for them. What do I think about Robert Kennedy versus DeSantis versus Trump effect on the economy? Well, I think if all three of them ran it, it's a good thing if the media will give them any attention. I don't, I mean, I don't think any candidate is perfect. Uh, they've got a lot of deficiencies, that's for sure. But at least there's something different. At least they're anti-establishment. I don't know, maybe DeSantis might not be. But at least they're going to have some different opinions that are outside of the, let's say, current acceptable narrative when you look at the mainstream media or if you look at the uh, kind of, quote unquote, establishment. And I think that's a good thing. Now, what impacts on the economy? I don't know that they'll have uh, any, as far as just the them running, I don't think they'll have a big impact on the economy. All right, guys, let's go ahead and do some shout outs. Now, this is the moment you have all been waiting for. Got a huge announcement for you. Let's go right over. I'm going to do this quick screen share, show you guys what I'm referring to. Boom, there you go. Start a brand new YouTube channel. It's called George Gammon Vlogs. And we've got our first vlog that's up. Uh, it's called Took Helicopter from Medellin to Guatape. Things got crazy, and they did get crazy. We had to go through like a almost a thunderstorm. But, uh, you know, I get questions about Medellin constantly, constantly, constantly. And everyone asks me, is it safe? Is it this? Is it blah, 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 blah. And so I thought, great, let's just go ahead and do a vlog video, and I'll just film pretty much what I do on the weekends. And uh, not really fancy editing, but maybe people will enjoy it, number one, because they might like to see kind of behind the scenes and what I do in my personal life. And number two, it can answer a lot of these questions as to what is it like in Medellin? Is it safe? Is it expensive? Is it cheap? How does it compare to the United States? Is it somewhere that, uh, you know, what's the education like? What's the night light like? What are the, what's the food like? What are the people like? You know, all of these different types of questions. And uh, so trying to kill two birds with one stone. And uh, I think you guys will really enjoy it. So you can check it out at George Gammon Vlogs. And we've got one vlog up. And we're in the process of getting two or three more. We'll probably do maybe one or two per week. So check that out. I think you'll really get a kick out of it. All right, let's do some shout outs here. Who do we have on the live stream? We have got uh, oh, Jack Koff. Oh, ah, ha, 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 ha. You got me on that one. That was good. That was good. That was good. I, di I didn't understand that. I didn't catch that one until I had already said it. So bravo, my friend. Good job. We've got Texan RR in the house. Market Mania, Vic McLausick, Atlas, Good Witchy, Baxter, All Nighter, Hyder, Wayne Smith, some OGs in the house. Jelani Thompson, Forrest C., Pickle, Pickle Potamus, Bob Johnson, Eric Rosenberg, Jim Wolf, Risky PS6, <laughs> Matt Bittner, Meto, ah, oh, shoot, skipped on me. Sorry about that. Christopher Kirwan, Mr. B, Thomas McGinnis, Mark, Carlos Garcia. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your evening, your weekend. Make sure that you are standing up for freedom, liberty, free market, capitalism. And I will not only see you on the next video, but I will see you in Orlando, May 12th through the 14th at Rebel Capitalist Live. Got to get your tickets ASAP at rebelcapitalistlive.com.